We have a, uh, I think a 16 point agenda with a scratch of number 13. I'll take a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Okay, Williamson Manning. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Have an agenda. The previous minutes were published. Do you have any corrections, additions, or changes? If not, I'm going to declare those approved as published. Takes us down to reports. Southwest Regional Planning. Mr. Troy Maggie is with us. Should I pop up here real quick? Please. Sure. Um, I'd like to ask um, Bob Keeney to join me for one. Bob Keeney's a um, Bob Keeney is the chair of Grand County. Well, yes, uh, the chair of Grand County Board also and chair of the Southwestern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission as well. Yeah. Um, so we appreciate your time on your agenda. Um, I had sent in advance kind of a summary. I know you all have some hard decisions to make, and so I just wanted to make sure that we were on your radar and the work we do and have been doing and can do for you. Um, so I put together a brief memo. Um, which I won't read, of course, uh, cover to cover, but I didn't want to take a time, uh, take a minute to just kind of kind of share how we fit in, I guess, with the overall um, world of Southwest Wisconsin. And, and the first thing you'll notice, we've been around 52 years. We've got a half century of working with Richland County and the other four counties, Grand Green, Iowa, and Lafayette County. Um, a couple of things that really drive us and how we think about how we can support you. The biggest thing, or one of the biggest things is capacity building. That's what we do day in, day out. And of course, it's more urgent than ever. We do that in a couple of different ways. One of the things we do is really provide auxiliary staffing and revenue from the outside. Um, we serve as institutional knowledge. So we have new people coming on board. Um, we set up, we meet with them, we share the tools, the financing streams, the data we have to help them make decisions. So always adding capacity. The other thing we'll do, frankly, is kind of help reduce the demand on your own capacity. And you'll see that in the memo uh, in our administration of the revolving loan fund that's supporting Richmond County businesses. Uh, without our administration, that would fall to the locals. Um, also, the programs such as the Main Street Bounce Back Program, which is a stimulus program, and it will go away. Uh, but from an administration standpoint, it's been highly effective in the partnerships to move that money. I had a call with Todd Novak, who's the assemblyman of the 51st district, right? So he'll cover Lone Rock, Buena Vista, Ithaca, some of that area. Um, and they liked the state local regional partnership. So we referred to Jason Glassbrand at the local level to confirm some of the due diligence for those grants. We administer them across the regional level and it's, it's a highly effective partnership. So that's kind of the capacity building piece. The other thing that we do and continue to try to do is get ahead of where you are. All of our counties are sort of putting out fires or even day-to-day -day management. So the plans and the studies that we do, and Steve brought this to my attention and I should hit home, I appreciate that, is really setting the region up for future investments. So a couple of examples that I have to point out are the housing studies we completed in 2018. We've got a series of firms that are making investment decisions based on the documents that we put together. Um, one is going up in Dickeyville. Uh, we've had one um, uh, go up um, uh, in, in Broadhead, I believe it was. Um, so we're finding those <clears throat> folks to implement the plans that we put together after we study the market and see where the investments are. Um, I guess the last two things are alignment, and this is something obviously we need to work better on, but aligning what we do with what you need and making sure you're aware of that. Uh, it's very, very easy now in Richmond County. You have a strategic plan that's very clear on where you need to go. And that's why I framed this document around your strategic plan. I want to make sure we're complementing what you do. And Jason Glassbrenner and his colleagues, we talk about this a lot. We don't need to do what you do. We need to complement it all. In fact, Bob Keeney, when I came on board, that's the first question he asked me. Okay, I have Ron Brisbane, Grand County Economic Development. Why do I need regional planning to do economic development? And it's the right question, right? So we're always looking for ways to do something different than you to augment what you do, complement what you do, and, and align with that. Um, I guess the last two things I'll point out, I think we're really cost effective. We have really low overhead for a lot of reasons. We don't have swag. We don't sponsor conferences. We don't drive vehicles with our car or name on the side. We're, we're a very lean operating model. 
Uh, we have competitive wages, but we're pretty lean operating models. So we can save you on a billable rate uh, for a lot of projects. Um, so I think that's kind of hitting the highlights, I guess, um, of what's kind of informing the document we sent for you, uh, or we'd rather we sent out to you. Um, the only thing I really want to point to is really at the top of the second page. We're really bringing in and enabling you to get about a dollar eighty-one annually for every dollar that you invest in regional planning, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of seventeen five, I think, um, seventeen thousand five hundred. Um, incidentally, we've been able to bring the county portions of regional planning's revenue down from about twenty one percent to sixteen percent. So, with the funding you get. Um, we really springboard that, and it's on the bottom of the screen that, that Clint is sharing. We really springboard that into additional revenue. Um, so, for the dollars you give us, we're able to take that and bring in additional revenue. So, I guess I'll take a breather there. Invite Bob if, if you would like to speak uh, to anything, or if there's any questions or something I might speak to as well. Well, just as uh, being chair of the commission and being on the commission now for over eight years, uh, I see the regional efforts and uh, I realize that there's a river between you and the rest of us, but we're all in the same kind of demographics. Uh, we do have a uh, UW system school, rural area, and uh, I think the regional efforts that regional planning can put forth help benefit everybody involved in the uh, return on investment for that 17,000 that you invest, uh, it, come, it comes back in many ways. We, we can't realize all the dollars and cents, but it's the ideas and uh, things that we see from here to the Illinois line all the way over to Green County and uh, the other efforts in the region. So I think the uh, federal EDA is one of the big things that I see back to the question that I did pose why do we need both economic development locally and regionally? It's because of the connection to the feds. And so I would hope again that uh, you would remain a part of the Southwest Regional Planning Commission. Bob, um, did you say connection to the feds? Yes. Federal? Federal EDA. Yeah. Economic okay. Development. All right, well, thank you, gentlemen, for, for budgeted for 23, it's 24 plus. Yeah, yeah, we understand that. And if, if there's an opportunity in the future to, to talk about the partnership, if it needs to evolve or we need to change our reporting, or if there's an opportunity for me to share this with the whole board, I appreciate all of that. So thank you for your time. Well, here. I know you got a lot of and Troy, I know that we didn't, we didn't get you to a meeting of the entire board. And that's, on meeting, but I just didn't think it was appropriate with the things we were discussing to drag you into the middle of it. So I promise that you will have an opportunity to address the entire Richland County Board and get their input too. So this is not a decision that just this group ought to make. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. All righty. Takes us down to a number six, local assistance and tribal consistency fund LATCF. Administrator Langrick. Mr. Chair, uh, looking tonight, uh, just for your audience, there's no action necessary. This, this is a report item. Well, bottom line is the county is currently is ineligible. We're continuing to explore if there's any chance of an accuracy in our ineligibility determination. But to bring you up to speed, uh, Section 605 Social Security Act added a section essentially for the American Rescue Plan to establish a local assistance a tribal consistency fund, which is kind of in very general strokes is a uh, discretionary uh, spending that's going out to many counties. We're one of the few in the state that is determined to be ineligible. Kind of the two major impacts of what establishes your eligibility is negative revenue impacts due to impartial and federal program changes such as the program um, to be eligible uh, uh, to be counties that participate in the 
payments in lieu of taxes, the PILT program administered by the Department of the Interior, and the Refuge Revenue Sharing Program administered, administered by the Fish and Wildlife Services are kind of the two different lists that you have to line on to be eligible for this program. We fall on the PILT one to the best of my, uh, we, we didn't fall on either one list, but we are on the PILT one. We're not on the Wildlife Services one, so we're not eligible for the grant. Which is kind of a bummer because it is an uh, example like Iowa County's $50,000 of discretionary types of funds that they're hitting. Uh, uh, Supervisor of Chair Keeney, I'm sure, I think Grant County, you folks uh, came across some funds for this. Uh, so, unfortunately, though, we are not on here. So, if you are asked about it, this kind of defines on why we're not on there. Again, we're trying to beat the bushes to see if there's some chance of a mistake or there's an oversight, but right now it's all things are pointing to currently ineligible. And that is my report on there. If you had any further questions, I can certainly try to entertain them. The links are on there uh, to check out the different re resources and the two different lists that are being referenced. Mr. Chair. Thank you. It takes us down to number seven response from members on future meeting dates. Uh, Mr. Chair. We'll decide that at adjournment. So why don't we. Pass that by. I can. I'll just maybe show it to you at a glance here. Um, this was the polling that we had done to try to gather availabilities for members of this body. Um, everything came back looking like this. Thursday was the most opportune uh, scheduled for that. Concerns with it falling on the same day as rules and strategic planning moved it back to today at one o'clock. Concerns came on availability of folks for one o'clock arrived at five o'clock today. Would like you folks to kind of decide on your calendars on what works for you so we can set a reoccurring date, if at all possible, um, on when you'd like to have a monthly finance and personnel committee meeting. This this committee is is important enough, important enough that we should have a standing meeting date. And uh, when you sign up for it or get appointed to it or elected to it, um, you ought to know what night. And probably I'm kind of aiming toward a night meeting, but uh, it's up to you guys. The, the best time for me is 8.30 in the morning, but not everyone shares that. So, but night meetings are fine. Uh, so I'll think about it, mull that over when we're going through. Uh, Number eight, discussion and possible action on response to resolution 2266. And A, staffing study and proposal on finance and human resources, Administrator Langren. Mr. Chair, I don't have a prepared um, cover sheet on this item, but I wanted to kind of give you folks uh, a little glimpse of where the progress is going to make sure that what we're studying is going to be acceptable in helping make decisions on what, uh, where we want to move with our modeling, if you will. So let me pull open the current items here that are again, are very in a draft outline format to make sure that I am fulfilling what the expectations are here. Stand by just a second here, so. Okay. Uh, so, kind of in, in talking from the summary points from the previous meeting, the things that stood out in listening back through that meeting were uh, talking points of we're not moving forward. The proposals brought forward leaves the county in a status quo. Now is the opportunity to remodel uh, comments on how do we get an HR and finance director slash departments. Um, we have a dispersed model. How do we centralize our HR and finance functions? Uh, comments on how many payroll finance folks do we have in the county? How many in other counties? Can there be efficiencies? Are we making more work for ourselves? Until we see a compare, uh, see and compare with other models, I do not know that we're going to get anywhere. And then the final comment again, kind of loop back around on the committee remains obligated to respond to the directives, uh, which called for the cuts. So the study that's kind of put in place, and I'll show you the worksheet that we're trying to consolidate all the information. Um, the first element is kind of the study of county comparisons. Uh, comparable with a narrative on why we're comparing with these folks. So I'll show you the sheet in just here in a second. Uh, supporting chart on the positions, limitations on really what are we asking counties and comparables. We certainly, we've been down this road and know that when we're talking with other organizations, other counties, it's very seldom is it apples to apples. It's usually 
apples to pears is the best kind of a thing. Usually you end up into oranges and turnips sometimes. Um, having a second session then that's really looking internally on our on our positions, uh, working kind of through the old JDQ model with Carlson Detman, where they took each function of our of our positions and then we've allocated how much of a capacity it is in that position. Say it's a weekly function at 80 percent or it's a monthly position equating to about 20 percent of the, the job. So working on that with the different departments and then finally arriving at the final section of what the report will look like, which is the modeling. Current vision right now for a modeling kind of a thing is to present you folks of what does the current model look like? What does it look like if you want to do an HR focused uh, type of initiative for a centralized HR function? Uh, option number two is a finance focused centralization. Uh, so, uh, third one being a let's do HR and finance. A fourth one then of really the focus back at the resolution uh, language, which called for a reduction in finances. Uh, how are you going to make that work with the reductions there? And then an option modifier of reverting back to an administrative coordinator model to potentially impact those four different options. Does this kind of sound like what you folks are looking for us to bring back? Um, give it up to the committee for your comments. Mr. Carroll, can we zoom in a little bit so I, I have it easier to read through that? Stuff. It looks fine on mine, Steve. I'm not sure. What <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Thank yeah, you. Here, here we go. Um, so, yes, again, the modeling uh, presenting you with a, a current model of what we're doing for HR and for finance types of functions, uh, an HR focused option, a finance focused option. A, let's centralize both of these types of option. Uh, presumably, those are going to have less budget reductions. Uh, we'd be looking to try to shift and make things work on very full plates. A option then is very focused on response to your resolution again, which is calling for financial reductions. And then with all these having a modifier in place of reverting to an administrative coordinator type of an option or a reduction in your administrator type of a role to consider. Is this kind of fit the different things that you're expecting to come back to in this report? I would say yes. And do you have a tentative timeline as far as? I'm hoping to get this to you in December, which okay. is going to be a lot of strain on getting back with my department heads and saying, how do we, how would this, if this, if they go and they say, yes, we want to do this, what functions can move? What functions would have to be absorbed by other folks? What functions potentially can fall away, which is probably few and far between. So do you want from us a direction or are you going to do all A through L originally? Yeah, these are all, this is what I plan on presenting as of okay. right now. If there's things on here that you're like, you're wasting your time, then let's take those off. If there's things that we're missing the mark and you actually, you know, other models that you visualize that you want to see that we're not thinking of, then let me know. Can you scroll back up? Yes, sir. How far up did you want to go, Steve? But you talked about uh, counties not being apples to apples in your experience so far. What other county would be the most comparable in ours? Um, it depends on what the question is, Gary. I can show you the information that's coming back right now. I caution everybody that this, please do not hold this to the gospel standard as we typically do with some of our materials that we share. It's a very draft, um, but let me pull open where we're at today. Uh, with the folks that responded <clears throat> to us. Bear with me here. I'm going to stop sharing. Well, he's sharing. I will comment that one of my uh, uh, thoughts entering this year and even two years ago was can we centralize functions? For instance, can all the human resources be here in? in the courthouse and then spread it out through uh, the other divisions. Can we centralize finance and have them all here? And it sounds real simple to do, but of course, when we start looking at how it's broken up and how it's uh, done, it isn't that simple. How much of this do you have? I can't believe you can have it done in a month. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much you have already started, but. I think I'll get it done. 
I believe you. <laughs> okay. And will there be uh, will there be questions still left with it? Yeah, there's going to be questions with it. There's also going to be, of course, the concerns too. On are, is this? Am I comparing it to what you want to be compared with to feel comfortable in the decisions and the recommendations? Is uh, spending too much time going in one direction? Yes. Bring it to us. Example right now. First example: comparisons on counties, which can become a touchy issue, and we can shoot holes in the study after the fact if it's not firmed up in the front end. Um, did not go just on a, who's the neighbors and uh, what's the population. Approach this from. Uh, looking at Department of Revenues on what are the expenditures, using this as a benchmark of how much financial activity are you kind of engaging in, and then also kind of compare it then with folks that are running a nursing home to try to gauge that group of folks that you know you're bringing in quite a few more, uh, quite a bit more uh, employees and HR functions along with that. So reached out to Lafayette, Pine Valley. I'm sorry, reached out to Lafayette, Vernon, Lincoln, Grant, and Monroe as being the folks closest to us in a financial type of a realm that are operating uh, with nursing homes, heard back from three of them. So I'm looking at a comparison again, I still have to reach out to these counties and confirm of what we talked about in the interview and responses back in emails is what I've got on the sheet here, but then laying it out like this to kind of show where our peoples are versus their peoples and how they have them organized in potentially different offices. Uh, and again, it's, you know, different elements are, that you're going to have to be, I don't know, say overlook or that you're going to have to rectify is that um, when I got on here, one, that's kind of just a person. It doesn't mean necessarily that their full FTE equivalent is dedicated to an HR finance function. It is a person in a chair. Uh, some of them are potentially in a part-time capacity on top of that. And examples of, uh, say, like Unified is working on behalf of Grant County and Iowa County. So how do you you know, try to still mix and match that. But again, the whole context is really how many people, where are they located, and how much estimate on how much financial activity that they're having along with how many employees are they supporting in their operation. Does that make sense? So this is what I have right now. The other element of it then is going to look like this in the background. It's uh, taking all the different positions and then breaking them down by their essential job function. Again, their capacity, how often they're doing it, what's the annual, annual amount, total hours towards it, and then answering the question of what happens if these duties and the employees are moved to a central location, how would it impact the function? What would happen if the duties were moved to a central location and the employee was reduced? And what, uh, what if we did without the duties and the employee or the questions to kind of answer with that is the, the premise to build on? What do we think we can do with modeling to tease out those types of questions? So with that being said, are we moving in the right direction? And is this what you folks are after in supporting a, uh, the modeling coming back? Or are there other questions, different counties, different ways of looking at the positions uh, that are going to rise to potential concern when a recommendation is brought forward? Mr. Carroll, yeah. um, comparison with other counties is helpful. And, and but like you said, there's a lot, there's going to be lots of notes to, to, to to find why things aren't exactly apples and apples, but back to our, our own uh, revenues and, and expenditures, are you seeing the spreadsheet view changing or adding some function to it? Or I guess what I'm saying is we know we have a hole to fill, and it'd be nice to see a, an ongoing running total of where we stand, a view that gives us that, so that is as we as we make choices or selections, we see what the impacts are and see how close we are to our goal. Is this in context of the study, Steve, or in the in context of the financial and responding to the resolutions? The, the resolutions. Okay. I think you're right, Steve. I mean, this whole discussion came about the last meeting. I was a little frustrated because we had asked, you know, the savings from our our area, Clint's area, and and. He really didn't, he couldn't show us what he was saving. You know, he, there was no way to do it until he did this additional information yeah. study. But he says he'll have it ready in December. There's a doubter in the room. Will be, there'll be a big bow on it. I'll come back to here and then full board then. 
Yes. Okay, I, I'll accept. Ms. Locke, are you with us? I am. What do you think? Um, I think all of that information will be incredibly helpful. I will add, though, that as I'm sitting here thinking about how much work this is and hearing the comments, um, I do think as a committee, we should remember all of these things that we keep asking of Clinton and staff, because when we go to do his review and, you know, there's a lot of things that we asked him to do in this last year when we reviewed him last year. Um, and obviously, because his capacity has been so consumed by answering all of our questions and doing all of these studies. His ability to do other work will be affected. So I, that was just, um, I, I think the data is important and I think it's worth having him do it, but I just think we do need to remember that when it comes to reviewing his accomplishments in the last year. We're asking Clint and his staff, Cheryl, to do more and more and uh, trickles down and hits the departments and their leadership heavily. Right. Okay, let's take up discussion and possible action regarding other resolutions and community responses. A, response from Pine Valley. And I think it would be helpful if we could read the, re the current resolution. Do you have that language, Clint? As modified and amended? I can pull it up one second here. <clears throat> So I, I think that would be helpful to before we look at the response. You don't have to read everything, but maybe just the, the final uh, amended version. A resolution 2292, uh, which was directed to Pine Valley. Uh, be it therefore resolved, Pine Valley and Child Support Standing Committee is specifically tasked with the following Pine Valley and Child Support operations. Explore the possibility of Pine Valley generating profits that annually equal 50% of their mortgage payments to be used by the county for operations or capital projects outside of Pine Valley and return to finance and personnel with a report by 10-31-2022. Be it for the result of Pine Valley and Child Support Standing Committee Chair through the powers established authority to the chair. So that was the uh, major directive. Um, there was follow on questions asked on behalf of the ad hoc committee, which have been pushed back out to the board of trustees for consideration. Uh, you'll see that in your packet. And then you'll also see then the response that came back from Pine Valley. Um, it's the same response that was in there from, uh, from last meeting that we had uh, began talking about before we adjourned. Okay, and basically, if I can summarize um, the response from Pine Valley, Tom Rislow, um, we asked him, can you generate uh, half of the, the annual payment? It's one, well, the total payment is 1.5, 1.482 million. And which meant he had to come up with a a contribution of seven hundred forty one thousand four hundred fifty six dollars, and he gave us the. And I'm looking at his response here. The short answer is no. The longer answer is yeah, I could have done it for seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, and even twenty with COVID dollars. However, since uh, since then. Even the best forecasted year would only generate 23%. Uh, and why? Why is that? Well, uh, there's the government. You're working with the government, obviously. The level of funding, hands on care, we're having trouble hiring people, keeping them. Uh, heavy care need of residents, staffing shortages, high cost of contracted staff. Rising wages, cost benefits, have little or no fat left in expenses, have continued to turn away potential admissions due to staffing, have less rev revenue because of lower occupancy. And I'm on the Pine Valley Committee, 
and I know that Tom has talked to us about if we lose X number, we'll, we'll have to close down the wing. If we close down a wing, then we're really uh, in trouble with occupancy. Uh, the occupancy levels for Pine Valley compared to other nursing home facilities is excellent. Uh, we've maintained around that 80 to 90% level. Um, and also the thing here about Pine Valley is they have cash in reserve. They have done a good job of reserving a capital fund, a uh, operating cash fund. So uh, those are all good things. And I venture to say that because of that excellent, excellent uh, reserves, I'll call them, it, it did enable the county, Richland County, to uh, raise in our bond rating because we had that. So you're not only looking at reserves for Pine Valley, you're looking at reserves for the entire county. So in that, in that regard, um, you know, Pine Valley is an asset in many other ways, or at least one major way than simply providing a service for the residents of Richland County. Uh, comments from my board, my committee. Mr. Chair, this is Melissa. I have a question. Is Mr. Rizlo in the room? He's not. Come on. But there are other people here from Pine Valley. Why don't you? What's your question, Melissa? I've got some of my paperwork with me from the last meeting. Okay, so um, I'm sorry that I don't have exact details, but Bethel home in Viroqua um, recently was a nursing home. A skilled nursing home and they recently closed the nursing home section, but are, but remain open offering other. Services, um, and that's the part I'm unsure of exactly. I know it might be. Rehabilitation more assisted living um, and the reason they did that was because of staffing issues and many of the same concerns that we've heard over and over. Um, from Pine Valley in the last couple of years. And my understanding is when they change to a different kind of facility, the, the laws and rules that must be followed change dramatically. Staffing levels drop, especially in the nursing, 24 hour nursing. So I just was wondering um, if potentially we should be pursuing that kind of care instead of it, uh, and maybe it would be better to close one of our, uh, what do they call them? pods, whatever he calls them there, um, wings, whatever. So I just didn't know if that's been considered, talked about, um, but they seem to have turned around their financial situation from my understanding. My dad's on the board. That's the only reason why I know any of this. Um, and I, but unfortunately I didn't ask him enough questions and I can do that, but I just wondered if Tom has spoken with the Bethel home people in Viroqua. Okay, um, identify yourself and my speak name. loudly. I'll just come up here. I'm Chris Glassinger. I'm the HR director for Pine Valley. Um, so Bethel Home did close their nursing home. They transitioned it to a CBRF, CBRF or assisted living, and that is a different skill set. We do have an assisted living. Um, it's only 16 bed. And the reason why they did that, of course, was because of staffing. That is a huge undertaking. Um, and you can only take certain residents. You can't take the residents that we have. So essentially, everybody that is in the nursing home would not qualify to be in the assisted living. So all our our CVRO people are fine, but the whatever it says right now, I'm not exactly sure. Those 60, 70 people would not qualify. So where would they go? Um, and I know it was for staffing for Bethel. That is just something that to me would be unattainable because there's different training involved. Yes, you do need a nurse here and there, but um, you have to have a different skill set to work in a CBRF than you do as a CNA, two different skill sets. Um, it just, it's not something that I would see feasible. Okay, Melissa, did you hear that response? 
I did, yep. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? John, we're going to have Teresa speak. Just, just briefly, I wanted to mention the amount of revenue that the skilled nursing facility brings in is much higher due to the Medicare, um, the different funding sources and the, and the skill set needed to take care of these residents. So as Chris spoke to, it's provide you're taking care of very different clientele in a SNP compared to a CBRF and the revenue um, is much more the reimbursements are very different as opposed to assisted living and you know we share our financials every month and I feel like the nursing home has been doing um, pretty well you know comparatively especially to yeah. other nursing homes the auditors would say the same uh, my my response to that would be uh they're two different things. One is a old folks home, basically. The other is a nursing, skilled nursing facility. So, and, um, and there would have to be placement for, as Chris said, that you can't transition and keep the same residence. No, they would no, have to go to a nursing home. Of course not. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Well, unless you want to take further action on the Pine Valley response, uh, We'll accept we'll accept the report as as given to us, and uh, let's you have further need of information, um, Mr. Carroll. Yeah, um, is that sufficient response for us to know what they would um, want us to put on referendum versus not? I mean, we still need to know that, and, and at some point, if on all the all of the. Uh, Departments we're going to have mm -hmm. to know. Right. What was that a directive? The dollar was that a directive, Steve, for the referendum? It was, yeah. Because I it wasn't part of the original. It was not part of the original yeah, resolution right. or questions that have come up through ad hoc committee. It was in the follow up questions the ad hoc committee went back to Pine Valley to with. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So these were the follow up questions here, if I'm yeah, not okay. mistaken, Steve. So I believe this year going to be brought back to the board of trustees yeah. to see how they would like to respond to this. Okay. So it's in, in process. So it's a work in progress, I would okay. say. Next trustee. Do we have those in our packet? They are. They're in your packet. It is item number 09. 09. Okay, there they are. Oh, yes. So I think we really can't take any more action on this until right. we get those responses. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, takes us up to B, response from Simon's Natatorium. I have some knowledge of that because I'm on that board. Um, and Tracy, Goldman, the director, is given the task of researching this, and it, it's not easy finding what she researched was could could Simons operate on its own? Could it become a nonprofit uh, uh, entity? So operated by a non it would have to be profitable but it would be operated by a nonprofit board or commission she talked to the current uh pine valley board of directors they have a separate foundation i think she said none of that wanted to do it uh, she talked to one of the interesting adjuncts that she took was talking to uh, ymca we become a YMCA. She found out that YMCAs, uh, just to talk to them, it was very costly. Um, I think you'd have to apply and pay for a franchise to 
become YMCA, and I think there are population requirements. And so basically, we rejected that plan, although she's included it, I think, in her description. Trying to get her description up here. It was zero nine B B. Well, yeah, I'm getting the agenda cover sheet there under nine B. Must be nine B A maybe. Well, double B. Got it. Okay. Um, she talked about, which is something I never thought about, if, if you become a nonprofit or a separate entity, then you have to start paying health insurance and uh, different things for the employees, everything changes. Uh, she'd have to hire a payroll person, insurance liability. Right now it's all through the county, that all changes. Uh, IT costs would be on the that facility. Right now they enjoy the, the uh, using the county for their IT needs. Uh, paper products, attorney costs, so. Uh, basically, I, I had her add the last part of her, her uh, report talking about could Simons take over the, the field house or the gym, the gymnasium there, which is only a couple hundred feet away and could you run that as a maybe on the on the order of a baraboo play just a game or whatever those are called the basketball facilities there? So she did uh, did some research. Uh, she could make some revenue from that, but not enough to stand alone. Someone asked her, can't we just increase fees to a, a more competitive level? She did say that if you raise every fee, and I think she was looking at family memberships, individual fees, if every fee was increased $150 annually, then it would make it would make money on its own, which I'm not sure if that's a reasonable level or not. So, um, I guess, what do you want to do with Simon's at this point? Mr. Chair, this is Melissa. Go ahead, Melissa. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah, your, your audio keeps cutting out occasionally. Um, I just, the one question I have with this is, she is absolutely correct in that 36,000 is what we budget for from our operations fund every year. But I do think it's important to point out that we have invested a lot of capital money into that facility. Um, I think we just did the pool. I think we've done a roof. I mean, I think there's, and I, I guess I would, I would at least like to know what that in the last five years, how much capital money has gone towards Simon's um, because it isn't just, we have to maintain the bill. If we keep it, we have to maintain the building. And therefore it isn't just a matter of, the 36,000 and I realize that capital we borrow for, but if we're not borrowing it for that, we could be borrowing it for other capital projects for other facilities within the county. So I would be interested to have that information. Good question and Administrator Langrick has the answer. I don't it right at this moment, but we'll track it down, Mr. Chair. But you're absolutely correct, Melissa. I know we put a new roof on I know we just replastered the pool, and that isn't included. The thirty-six thousand dollars we spend wouldn't make a dent in those things. So uh, we've made it part of capital borrowing. It lends credence to my my position that the county owns too many buildings and 
perhaps one swimming pool too many. I don't know. Anything else? Do we want Tracy Goldman to do anything else for us? Are we accepting her report as written? Did the ad hoc committee have questions for her? Not that I'm aware of this time, Mr. Chair. Again, to review on the specifics of what was directed, resolution number 2291, uh, directed in Simons and Auditorium Operations, encouraged to explore the transfer of Simons to a nonprofit organization, including research of similar nonprofit models and return to finance personal committee report by October 31st. Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you. And Simons is unique. Uh, I don't think there's any other facility. I think there's one other one in the state that is perhaps county or municipal run. I think we'll be talking more about Simons. I don't think we've finished that discussion. Let's move to C, response from Richland Economic Development. And Mr. Langrick, could you refresh us as to the initial resolution? Initial resolution 2291, same resolution, uh, economic development operations encourage the Red Board to explore a public private partnership or public sources make up half and private sources make up half of the economic development budget. A return to finance and personnel committee with a report by October 31st, 2022. I would defer to Director Glassbrenner potentially to kind of walk us through the response. And then do keep in mind there was additional questions from ad hoc committee that has been asked of Red, in which Red, I think, plans on responding at their next meeting in December. No, November. November. Yeah, thank you. I think we had to reset it for the 14th. Thank you. Um, so I can pull up the response here. Uh, this is the. Same response that would have been in your folder from last month. It talks through, I believe, on four different courses of actions uh, put in, in, in preference of what the, uh, what the board uh, feels is the best idea or the highest recommendation down to the lowest recommendation. Did I state that correct, Jason? Correct, yes. Okay. So that's on page four is kind of the recommendation hierarchy. Jason. What uh, what is that under in our nine C nine C scroll far enough. Jason, are you going to handle this? I can answer any questions. Do you as economic director? Um, what what's that? Sorry. As economic director, part of your duties here, could you walk us through this? Sure. Yeah. So um, that page really summarizes. Um, if you're looking for four models, gives four models of from the highest recommended model to the lowest recommended model. Um, it goes from number one is the recommended model from the board is to stay as it's currently functioning. A second model. <clears throat> um, rather than moving to a place where there has to be private funding would be to go completely to the city to find out if the city could fund the, the role um, in, in its entirety. The third option would then be the one that was kind of proposed, I think, by the county, which is to red funded 50% by the county and city and 50% by private businesses. And then the fourth one is red becomes a self-funded private nonprofit entity having to raise 100% of funds necessary to operate. So that is the order that the red board had identified and is submitting. Um, I do think that the kind of the introductory paragraph or summary, it's not paragraph, it's the introductory summary page on page two really does a fairly good job of summarizing the view of the board um, and, and the belief that, um, I think, uh, the last paragraph says it, it is critical to note that Richland economic development is one of the few county departments that has the capacity to generate revenues that cover all of the associated costs of department. Once departmental costs are covered, the economic development office produces profit. 
The Red Board has discussed and reviewed data and believes that it is reasonable to postulate that Richland economic development, approximately 2.5 or two years and five months into the current structure, has already generated enough new repeat yearly revenue for the county and city to pay 100% of its operating costs. And there's an exhibit B attached that goes through some of the revenue streams that have been experienced through the efforts. This means that all future revenues that are generated from projects that Richland Economic Development helps facilitate should be understood to be 100% profit. These profits can now be used to fund other departments and services that are unable to produce revenue streams through their operations. So it is quite a unique, um, it's quite a unique department to have and, and function for the county to have. And those revenues are primarily coming from additional tax revenue that's generated from net new construction. So there are several projects, again, documented in Exhibit B that um, have a very high likelihood of having not progressed had the office not existed. One of those um, is, for example, the CDBG project, which the county had $1.2 million. That money was on the verge of being lost. We were able to recover that. Uh, Chairman Brewer has mentioned that numerous times. We've talked about that. Um, and as a result of the office being there, we were able to maintain that those monies in the county. So from that particular effort, effort you would expect to have increased sales tax, increased tourism, removal of bright blight so that property values and community attractiveness increases. The auditorium experienced a new renter because they now have handicap accessibility to the top floor. The rent revenue is roughly $3,000 a month, and there were two to five new jobs created in the community just because we were able to maintain the money. Um, Lone Rock then experiences primarily a, a more attractive Main Street, a park that can be used by their entire community, and it really increases the positive uh, view of their community, and they hope now that there will be more businesses attracted to to their main street and or more citizens that want to live there. So that's just an example of how, you know, one example of how economic development was able to do um, something that probably would not have happened had the department not existed. Mr. Carroll, Jason, on model number three, did you uh, approach the commercial sector to explore their their openness? Yes. Yeah, so as you know, um, we do have several from the commercial sector that are on our board, including um, the manager of Walmart, the former manager of Rockwell, who is now a manager at Seats. Um, trying to think, we have. Um, we have a person that represents the banking industry. So we have pretty good representation. And so their opinion of the analysis that we went through was that why would private industry pay for something that's obviously generating a profit to the county already? So we're basically, it's kind of like double dipping in a sense, if I could say it clearly, it's like, okay, the county has created a position which is now paying for itself why are the businesses paying for that again? So you took the, the so we put from the board itself, not beyond that. Um, that's correct. Of course, the former chair, and I believe Marty probably, Chairman Brewer probably has experience with the way it formerly operated in the county. It was a partnership where there were donations that were gathered from different private industries. And it's my understanding that at the point that they looked for the county and city solution that it was becoming more and more difficult to gather those donations from the private industries that had been involved. Is it, does, do you believe that's I, accurate? I really can't. I don't know. Okay. So that, that's my understanding of it. Um, Before my time, but... So there were no other additional industries other than what we have represented on the board currently where we went out and said, hey, would you be willing to donate should this get canceled in its current form? I'll speak to this, though. I think... The most likely outcome should the county withdraw its funding is city funding. I, I can't speak for the city, but it looks to me like that would be in the best interest of Richmond Center to continue this. Now, having said that, 
I think it's very important that Richland County be still involved in red because I mean, then you have a county aspect rather than because, and you, um, I mean, I, I represent a rural, you know, my, my district is rural. It's basically the township of Henrietta. So <clears throat> Henrietta wants to know what, what we're doing for them. And without, you know, I, I, I don't know how I could demand from Jason if he's employed by the city of Richland Center, to, but he points out that we could hire him maybe on an hourly per hourly basis. So I think though it's, to me, it's vitally important that the county, if we want to reduce our, our presence financially, perhaps we can do that, but I think we still need a seat on that red board. Okay, that's my thought on it. Anyone else? Melissa, I want to weigh in on this one. I do. I, ha I have a question. So in, in looking at exhibit B, your impact tracker, um, so you're saying that this is because you brought Dollar Tree, Dunkin' Donut, Panorama building to Richland County, that Richland County is receiving property tax increases for those properties in those amounts. That's correct, right? I'm reading this right? Right. Any Anytime there's a new business, new home, net new construction is added, you take the mill rate at the county times the value that's added to the tax roll, and that's additional revenue that comes to the county. So you're, I, I guess one question I have is, so we already include net new construction into our budget, but you're not trying to tap into that as, as that in, that's covering your salary. What you're saying, these are additional property tax revenues that was are brought in. In addition to the net new construction, where we can write, raise our operating levy. I'm, I'm not sure I understand. I'm saying that perhaps um, I, I think what the board is saying is that it should be recognized that when they are involved, the reason that your net new construction does increase is, in fact, because economic development has been involved and in, in this list of projects. So. Yes, you're factoring that into the budget, if I understand correctly, and, and Clint's looking at that revenue, but there's no mechanism that I understand in the county for saying where do, or for my department or economic development to say, where did the revenues come from? So there's no revenues assigned to the actual department in the case of economic development. Does, does that answer the question? I think so, because with the point I'm trying Make, there are other departments that I've been working with in responding to these requests, these resolutions, where we have identified revenue streams um, that their office gets credit for. Right? Um, I mean, most of the, I think all the revenues actually go into the general fund and it's, you know, it's only because the department has identified it as a revenue stream coming from their department. So if in fact we can track new, new businesses that you've in to create increase in property tax revenue for the county, it, it seems legitimate to me that you could count that as revenues brought in for your department and therefore you can make the statement you're paying for your position. So I, I think for me, it has to just be very clear that this is not money that's already counted in a pot somewhere else. So, you know, when we're trying to say you, you've created enough income to cover the cost of your department. I want to make sure that it's real and true income. Is that, am I making myself clear? No. Mr. Chairman. I think they might be talking down and we can't hear them. Yes. Uh, I can hear you a little bit now. Yeah. You guys keep cutting out. Mr. Chairman. Don, they're, they're having trouble with their audio, so they're talking and we can't hear them. Give them a second. Okay. So can you hear us now, Supervisor Locke? I can, yes. What, uh, what John? I, are, I can uh, hear you. IT support is saying is that there's a little bit of a delay of when you folks stop talking. We should wait just a second before we start talking. 
Okay. That being said, what I think what we're trying to arrive at is when the state releases to the Department of Revenue is kind of what our net new construction and our increase is going to be for that revenue flow. Uh, what Red is saying is that some of that should be appropriated and viewed as new net new construction that's being generated on behalf of, of economic development. Um, how we would arrive at that number is if we identified the individual parcels and teased out what the new construction and the value of that potentially is, um, you could take that amount times the mill rate, divide it basically by a third, uh, depending on what Southwest Technical College, a third, maybe a little bit less, and you'd be able to arrive at a number of trying to uh, show a return on investment. Is that is that what we're, we're talking about? Yes, I don't want... I don't want the money that, you know, I don't want us counting it twice. You know, I don't want us saying we're counting in that new construction in our overall budget in, in one place, but then red board is saying, well, really we're covering part of Jason's salary from net new construction and we're counting it twice. So I, I just want to make sure it's a real, it's a real allocation. I think we're on, we're on the same base. Mr. Okay. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. C, go ahead. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I think that, uh, that the argument is valid in reference to that the new construction. We're counting that new construction as part of our revenue. Had uh, these projects not been accomplished, uh, that net new construction revenue would not be there. So I, I think his, his argument is valid. Yeah. Thank you. There's one other element to it then. Um, again, looking back to item number 09, ad hoc committee uh, responses to it, I'll just bring to your attention then uh, the additional questions or inquiries that have come from ad hoc committee. Oh, that's not it. That's thank you, John. Um, there's two two additional elements here, research from other counties that have private funding for economic development, i.e. Vernon Green, including the amount of time it takes to fundraise and how the governing board is represented by private co uh, contributors. And then resolution 2291 directs Red Board to explore half of its budget coming from private sources, uh, which amounts to approximately 37 per year. Um, how, uh, we are seeking information about how much of the, that amount the Red Board would like to have placed on a referendum versus a permit reduction in the red budget. So those are the two elements yet that are coming back to the red uh, red board in November. So when I've talked to Chairman Brenninger, has been I personally don't do research on on green county um we tried to connect current uh but that uh both models are different very difficult to compare because uh, both counties have pretty sure burning has double or both both green is bigger than burning both populations are double and both business Population base and revenue base, all this is what we're trying and then we can present that. Okay, let them go. Excuse me, gentlemen. This is Barb, and I'm really sorry, but but I'm not sure if you are counting on your online people to make your quorum that you are being compliant with um, open meetings because we can't hear what's going on there. So if it's a technical issue, I don't know if we need to stop the meeting and restart the computer, but we can't hear it. Mr. Chairman, you can take a roll call to uh, confirm the absence or the presence of a quorum. But only if we can hear them, Don. Well, if we can, hear, if we can respond, uh, if we can hear them and respond, if he hears our response, he knows he has a quorum. 
but uh, if you can't hear what they're saying, how are you voting on what they're putting forward? Exactly. Well, if I can't hear him, that's another story. So far, I can. Main focus would be on Supervisor Luck as she would complete our quorum. So I would defer to Supervisor Luck if you're able to hear us and follow our conversation. If not, then I might recommend Chair Brewer if we take a five minute recess to see if we can restart it, if that would make a difference. If we have concerns that Supervisor Luck is not able to participate in our discussion, um, then we would then we would in fact want to adjourn. So I couldn't hear anything that Jason said at his last remarks. I could hear there was noise, but I couldn't make out anything he was saying. Um, I don't, could we possibly use the microphones instead of the owl? That does seem to always work in my experience. We'd, have, we'd probably have to recess for five minutes and restart. It, it's really hit and miss. I can hear most of everything and then all of a sudden you guys cut out. So I don't know what to tell you. Recess and reset and try to restart. Warm pitches up, Marty. I didn't hear anything Steve Williamson just said. Yeah, I didn't either. Yeah, they're going to reboot. It's just not working. You know, I don't know what you want to do. Brace your feet. I'll probably place you. 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 Do we need to restart our and leave the meeting and restart, or are they just doing it on their end? Also, can you hear me now? Not, not great. It's got to be on their end. I don't believe it's on yours. How about now? That's better. I was sitting back at my desk. I rebooted stuff so we can try it when they get back. But okay. You can hear me well and we can talk. Yeah, you just got a little bit weird again. The the audio got strange again as you were talking. A WebEx issue or a network issue. Can you hear me? I can I can hear anyone online perfectly. Yeah. It's only the people in the room that I'm having issues with. Okay. Let's reconvene then. We do have a forum. We're losing Mr. Maggard and Mr. Keeney. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. You can drive carefully. There are a lot of deer between here and yeah, like ah. Okay. I guess we were done with economic development. It's going to be taken up at the next economic red meeting, red board meeting, which will take place on November 14th. Brings us to D, response from public safety. And I was asked by the chairman if we could delay that response. Ms. Luck, do you have a comment? Um, no other than to thank you for giving us until Friday to respond. Okay, thank you. Would you want me to go into detail for the committee to to tell them why we why I, it is not complete yet? You can, but how's how's the how is it going otherwise? Oh. So I sent out um, a dra the dra a draft of our response to the committee today. I, I took everything that the committee and the department heads talked about at the last public safety meeting. And incorporated it all into the document. Um, the reason that I was hesitant to submit it by yesterday was I really needed more time to make sure our numbers were solid. 
um, for salaries and other things. So I ask that we be given the committee be given the opportunity to look at it one more time on our meet, at our meeting on Friday. And so I did send out all of those documents today, and we will be reviewing them as a committee with the departments on Friday. And after the meeting on Friday, I will incorporate any changes and um, and then immediately forward it to finance for finance to review at our next meeting. Being as the ad hoc referendum committee really needs information, we're good and public safety in my estimation would be a large part of that discussion. Uh, we may have to have a finance meeting, um, another one in November to get that information pushed through to the ad hoc referendum committee. Just thinking out loud. I think that's probably what we'll have to do, but uh, thank you for your brief report. Supervisor Luck takes us down to E, a response from Health and Human Services. And Administrator Langrick, if you would please read the resolution highlights and. Was there one second here, Mr. Chair? Okay, so this is resolution number 2296 as directed to the Health and Human Services and Veterans Standing Committee, develop a recommended list of proposed projected levy reductions in comparing the 2022 budget of $320,000 in 2024, $637,000 in 2025, $783,000 in 2026, and $1,004,000 in 2027, including but not limited to lines 1.01 through 1.92 and 17.01 through 17.92 in the five-year financial plan. Um, with us here tonight is, we have Director Clemens uh, that could probably do a better job on walking us through the different proposals that were entertained and recommended on to you folks tonight from the Health and Human Services Veterans Standing Committee. Thank you uh, for you people out there. and microphone land and uh, telephone. And Trish Clements is with us. She will be speaking. Okay. So we did put together a long range plan of proposed cuts that will equal the amounts that have been requested. Um, some of the highlights would be, and they are on the agenda item cover, to remove the request to replace the electronic health records, eliminate our APS crisis worker, um, we have already reclassified the three mental health therapist positions to mental health case managers. We would postpone filling the two mental health <coughs> therapist positions and contract out that service. So it would not be two full-time employees. It would be paid for the time that they are there working for us. We will remove the levy from the children's long-term support program, um, eliminate treatment court program, eliminate the lease custodian position and create a county custodian position. This will be started in 2023 and given that it will be a county position we can eliminate the part-time custodian position that we have leased we will decrease our technology budget right now our children and youth services have two workers on call one is a worker and the second is the supervisor we will eliminate that second person on call this will then decrease the amount of comp, comp payout in that unit um, we have removed the request to reclassify the Children and Youth Services Youth Aid Worker. Um, we are planning to move the nutrition program out of public health and have that into the ADRC. We will decrease the funds allocated to the transport transportation program. We will also allocate a part portion of the SOAR grant to public health. And then we will make decreases in our child placement fund and adult placement funds and look at eliminating up to five positions by the end of 2027. The ones with the asterisk are ones that we would be asking that the um, committee take to referendum or consider taking to referendum. Thank you. And those two are There's nutrition and... So the ones that we would be looking to go to referendum is the mental health therapist positions treatment court, 
um, our technology budget. Um, with nutrition program, there would be additional funds that we would be needed in that program. The last couple of years, we've had about 20,000 each year of ARPA funds in there. And so we would be asking to have those funds returned to that program once our ARPA funds run out. Same with the transportation program, we would be asking that the funding remain the same in the transportation program and then our placement funds. Uh, the nutrition, can you give us a little bit what that involves? So what our senior nutrition program does is it provides a meal at a suggested donation for anyone over the age of 60. Um, we currently have three meal sites where individuals can go and get a meal. Um, there's one in Richland Center that's five days a week. We have um, one in Rockbridge that's one day a week, three days a week, and then one in sure. Casanova that's three days a week. Um, so I think that was one day a week. That's one day a week. Okay, I had those bad words. Um, they also can receive a carryout meal. This was something that started during COVID where you could go pick up your meal and take it home. And then we also have home delivered meals, but where we are able to deliver meals due to funding is pretty limited. So all of that is part of that program. We do get some funds from the states to run the program, but it's not enough to fully support it. Thank you. And that you've recommended that be part of a, a referendum, have you not? Okay. Yes. Where is, uh, Administrator Langridge or Cheryl, where is that under my? This is 09E, Health and Human Services Response is the cover sheet. Uh, several other documents, 09E and F, uh, constitutes the worksheet that kind of it goes along and complements that um, and gives a breakdown kind of the service impacts as well. Ooh. Which one was that? I was, that's what I was looking for the, the, the numbers. Zero nine. This one has all the numbers. What is it? Nine one. Zero nine E and F. E and HHS and Oh, I see it now. Okay, there we go. So, Director Clements, it it seems to me that you've done a very good job of following the directive, and uh, be complimented for that. Many of these cuts, I, I don't like them. I don't want them. And maybe this is the, this is the thing that referendums are made for, perhaps meant for. Yes, Mr. Carroll. Yeah, um, I guess what I was looking for was you've identified the, the reduction items, but I, I I can't see how much each contributes to the reduction that needs to get. So if you pull up this one, this one will have it. That's what is that? Which one is that? Nine E and F. It looks like yeah, zero nine E and F. Full well, well, maybe that's up, but I. It's it's actually in your folder. It should be the one right above zero nine E. It's zero nine E and F. HHS and Vets resolution response. I was looking at EF. It's E and F. Correct. Right. Yep. There you go. <laughs> All right. That, that's what I need to see. Never mind. Through all of this, too, we've really looked at the staffing levels that we have at HHS because there's been a lot of questions with the refer referendum ad hoc. And we did at our HHS Veterans Board um, agree to not fill 13 positions without the approval of this committee and so that is a resolution that is contained in your packet um, and another one that's contained with you another agenda item cover is the staffing levels so in your referendum ad hoc you had that we had 75 employees um, we are proposing or requesting that it be updated to list the 69 employees that are contained within the department So are you looking for action from this committee? If you are willing to. And that would be on your staffing level and. Like at this point, you'd be looking to accept the report back from Health and Human Services and Veterans Board as having completed their directive and saying we've received what we need from that committee. 
uh, sounds appropriate. Right. Mr. Carroll. Yeah. Uh, okay. I was looking at this uh, E and F spreadsheet earlier, and I didn't quite understand the totals down at the bottom. If I understand how this is set up, if you're actually um, making more reduction than what was required. So part of that was because veterans had their recommendations and we had ours, so we put ours together separate from what the veterans recommendations were. Um, and so, yes, there is a little bit of wiggle room in there that we may not have to make all of the cuts that are proposed. Um, but when we started to remove one or the other, then it affects the long term. Um, and so this was what we could do. Okay. So you want a motion in that? Yeah, in order to yeah, I should make that motion to approve. HHS's plan as presented and commend her for a beautiful and excellent job. Do I have a second, Mr. Banning? Melissa, were you aware of the motion and second? Yep. Yeah. In favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we, we took some action. We took some action. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Um, response from veterans. Is that in our packet? I think there is a. 9F, maybe? Okay, we're going to go here. So, this is the response back following our potential library reductions. Uh, discontinuing issue in cemetery flag holders to family members of deceased veterans, elimination of veterans specialist office staff, decrease uh, commission per diem. Decreased commission mileage, cancel ETK computer program, and the asterisk was on there. There was additional minutes that the committee, I think, took action to. Uh, which one? Some of these. Where is it at? There were several of these that were action to lead back in. Well, the two asterisks. In the report and reference. More than those. Right here, it says the cemetery flag and the veterans benefit specialist will be forwarded to referendum right. ad hoc committee for their consideration. Okay, so this is what is coming forward as a report from them on their on their guidance. I will have to double check with the minutes. Uh, I thought there was one that might have been added back in. I don't have Mr. Chairman, I recall that. Uh, the, uh, the computer program, the ETK computer program, the committee, there was a consensus that that should be left in because it's beneficial to the efficiency of the office. It was purchased a year ago. Every county in the state except Richland County has it. And it was felt that uh, since it was just purchased it, that and since it adds to the efficiency of the office that it should be kept only having it one year is sort of throwing the baby out with the bath water and the other was of course the flag holders thank you the other comment that was made was that there was a request that the uh, benefit specialist position which was initially uh and Mr. Langrick can help me with this narrative. Initially, there was an understanding that the veterans benefit specialist position would expire at the end of 222. Then there was uh, a decision to extend it through 223 uh, and subsequently through 224. And then there was an amendment by uh, Mr. Gacho to extend it through 225. Uh, the 
members of the Veterans Committee are in favor of the uh, administrator's initial recommendation um, of having the position expire at the end of 222. However, uh, there was some sentiment toward uh, continuing it through 223. Additionally, in the budget for 223, if the Veterans Benefit Specialist is continued through that period, there is an item in the 223 budget providing for $15,000 for health insurance and the the person in the position has elected not to uh, participate in the health insurance program, so there is an additional fifteen thousand dollars there that can po- perhaps be removed or put in a contingency fund in the general fund. Mr. Saber, My, are you fifteen or fifty? Fifteen thousand. Fifteen. Thank you. Uh, I mean, Mr. Mr. Langrick can confirm that. I'm sure. I think what I need what I need to get for you folks is a, a more firmed up report on actions from that last meeting to make sure it's defined in there and bring that back to you folks at your next meeting with the other returns. I, I think that would be good. I think so we no should. Action. No action will be taken on this one. Takes us down to G. Response from UW Campus Food Service and UW Extension. And do we have a? Um, we do have email response back here. One second. So where they're at uh, right now, Education Com- uh, Standing Committee has followed the guidelines of the resolution passed on 16, uh, August 16, 2022. And this is from Chair Gentis. They have worked with food service and hired a new director who is developing and plan to increase revenues with new initiatives. Committee cut extending funding by 37,000 by reducing part time staff and reducing the 4 H apportionment to 85%. And the Richland campus, they are making plans to remove East Hall from UW system contract and have it available for rent or sale. Richland County Campus Foundation has agreed to contribute 100,000 for capital improvements with UW Platteville. The committee is at a stalemate with establishing a dedicated recruiter. The committee will be working on many other initiatives and will hopefully have them at a meeting with uh, have a meeting with UW Platteville administration to work on solving the enrollment situation. And I'm aware that uh, there are a couple of plans out there. One is from Mike Brenninger entitled how to save the campus and the other is from Mike Compton. Uh, basically the UW Flatville's response to uh, needs at the campus regarding the recruiter, et cetera. Both of those will be presented to the education committee on is their next meeting coming up. So the 14th 14th of November. Um, So I I think really there's no action we need to take here until we we see more from that. I I will tell you that there has been interest this week in the campus. And we've been talking to I don't know how, how to say this. We we one of the things that Mike Brenninger talks about in that in his recommendations is that the the campus should become a a city of learning, I believe, city of knowledge, city of learning, and just sounds good. Uh, but in that vein, we've talked to the Southwest Tech. We've talked to Richland schools. And we may see some movement from both of those entities, or we may not. But it it seems to me, personally, that anything we can do out there 
maybe not maintain the campus in its present model and configuration, but perhaps utilize the facility there to promote education of young people. Mr. Manning. What is their role this year? I've heard different numbers. Uh, actually, how many are enrolled 53, there? 53, 60, somewhere in there. And explain more what does food I can't hear Mr. Manning. Service, what does it actually consist of? Consist of? Well, the, is the, it just for the, the Road Runner Cafe, uh, Mr. Lang, they do our meals on wheels. Or, they do our nutrition program. Trisha can probably speak to that, correct? The Roadrunner campus is doing the ADRC meals. Yes, yes. Do they also do the meals here to jail? No. No. So maybe that'd be something that'd be helpful. Except remember, prisoners have to be fed seven days a week. I'm just bread and water, though. Or they get owling. So we we looked at that, Gary, uh, a couple of years ago when we lost the food service for the jail, and we we were lucky. We found a place to contract. And I, I Melissa, you're on the line. How's that going with the the contracted service for food at the jail? Um, logistically, there have been a few hiccups that we, but we seemed, I think we've gotten most of those ironed out with the new uh, company. Financially, it's actually saved us quite a bit of money. They are actually providing meals for less than we expected um, very competitively. So we've saved a considerable amount of money with the current vendor that we have. I'm not sure that food service, in addition to, they would have to provide meals seven days a week. Um, you know, there, there, there has to be two hot meals a day, um, you know, and three meals a day, not just one single meal that's provided to a food site. Um, so we did consider in depth several times when you were on the public safety committee and, and more recently, we, the last time we did a contract review, we did talk about other options that potentially could be out there like Pine Valley. And um, so far this vendor is, is giving us a service for a very reasonable fee. Roadrunner Cafe, uh, and we want to, you know to keep that entity something to consider in the future. Anything additional, Mr. Langrick? I really haven't covered here. I don't think so. We're waiting for a finalized response back. In um, what is, I think, some of the language uh, that involves working with uh, UW campus on. Uh, is mentioned here with emissions and with recruitment and the other element is firming up on what the response is going to be for most i think efficient or effective use of the the land and grounds out there so those are still the elements that are due back mr chair so um sorry i couldn't hear you but i'm going to talk in <laughs> um I, I have the same concern with just making sure that when we talk about um, costs of the campus that we are also considering the capital investments we've been making in the buildings out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's easy to say we only spend, what is it, 40,000 a year at one point, and now it's a little bit more than that, but we, we just put new roofs on. Putting the roof on copper top right now. Yes, Gary. Yes, I, I've got a question on the campus uh, property out in Dayton Township. I know they did a huge uh, the smart sale a few years ago. The smart farm. Yes, and I, I've always wondered where did that money go? We know, well, we know who owns the smart farm now. We did research, Clint and I, today and found out that it's owned by the Richland. Campus Foundation owns the Smart Farm. Now, where the the money for logging went, I don't know. I suppose to the foundation. That's part of their in their coffers. 
You said you saw several loads of logs go out of there. Well, it's close to our farm. It wasn't several. It was a lot. A lot. Uh, so, yeah, I'm sure it was a, a big sale. I, I've always been curious of where the money went and how much it was. I, I've never heard a dollar. Right, and maybe Linda can find that out for us. I don't know. <laughs> I, I actually can't quite hear Gary. He wants to know what money. And the money from the logging at the smart farm. Say it farm. again, Marty. Logging at the smart farm. Where did that money go? How much was it? Well, we didn't. We, it was a gift to the campus, to the foundation. It wasn't. We didn't pay for anything for that smart farm. Sad that. What, where did the money for the logging go? Oh, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to, I didn't hear, see, I couldn't hear him. I'll find out about the logging. I'm sure it went to the foundation because it all goes to the foundation. It's owned by the foundation and they run it. So I can find out about that. Probably tens of thousands of dollars, if not more. Yeah. Uh, so just a thought. Well, if the foundation the does have money. The dean of the campus used to reside at the smart farm, Linda. Wait, say it again, Marty. Campus dean, that was his place of residence, was it not? The smart uh, for a short time. Now they rent it out to somebody else. It was also the art instructor's home and another faculty member's home, but they all paid rent. Thank you. Uh, Linda, since we have you online, did you want to say anything more on the response? I didn't hear your initial because I have to admit I turned off my oven. <laughs> um, I think we're in the process of doing quite a few things at the campus. We did follow what the resolution asked us to do. And I think that um, hopefully things will start to move in a direction that will be more um, amenable to the county. Thank you. Thank you. More, more to follow. More, more yeah. to come. Do you have one more question, Linda? This question come to me a week or so ago, and I just now remembered it. What is our uh, potential maximum enrollment there? How many students can we enroll? What is the potential enrollment? What's uh, Gary's question is what's the maximum enrollment that the campus can facilitate? How many okay. students? It could facilitate approximately 490 students. If we were had all the buildings. We've never quite, you know, we've been up to that point. At 1 or 2 times. But Linda, the, the break even point is 200 students. Is it not? I've well, I that. don't know if they have an actual break even, but that would be close. That's, I've heard that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, no, no action taken there. Uh, response from land and zoning, uh, Administrator Langrick, do we have anything there? We do, Mr. Chair, you've got a response in your folder from the committee um, submitted through Chair Luck. I can pull it up here and I think she would do the best in walking us through that if you're able to, Supervisor Luck. Yep. Can you take us through that response, please? Yes, happy to do that. So, uh, essentially, the land and zoning standing committee feels that we can meet the requirements of the resolution, and we are not asking for anything to be put, placed on a possible referendum, just as a summary. Um, when we first looked at this, we were focused on that first, so I put at the top of that first paragraph, the language from the resolution and it says total projected levy operational expense reduction of $50,000 entering into 2024. And the same sustained reduction beyond and we, we really focused on that and. I read the resolution again and realized that the 2nd sentence comes with a, a, a quite large price tag is. So, these adjustments in the expenditures must account for the proposed increases in COLA compensation, etc. So. That what that created for us was we had to find what we thought we only had to find $50,000 and that actually is not the case. We have to be able to also cover the staff 
increases in insurance and uh, and raises uh, from 2024 to 2027 as well. So what we came up with is um, we are reducing the administrative assistant position that is at currently in the land conservation department to 50% time. Um, Parks is currently paying for 10% of this position. And if we cut this position to half time, there will not be a cap the capacity for this position to do parks work. So my understanding is there's been long been a conversation between Kathy Cooper and Carla Downa about the potential of fair office taking on some of those um, responsibilities. And we do not have a recommendation as to who sh should take on those for sure. Um, so the, the savings to the budget with the cut of that position to 50% would be $25,655. And then the, um, we had a long conversation about fees and our hesitation in increasing fees, but one zoning fee that we thought was a reasonable increase that is not, would not be overly burdensome to our taxpayers would be the private septic inspections that we all have to have, or the one those of us that live out in the country have to have once every three years. It's currently $25, sorry, my phone. Um, and we would like to increase that to $50, which would actually increase the revenues um, by $45,000 annually. So that total comes up to $70,655.95. So that easily covers the 50,000. And then when you get to that tricky part about covering the cost of raises and um, and other benefits. We, um, can you move that up a little bit? I'm reading it off your screen. So can you move it up a little, Clint? Yeah, thank you. Um, so you can see by the math there, um, there's several things going on in the zoning department. We currently have an open GIS position. Um, that position has not received any qualified applicants. So the committee is working on potential contract options, both in the short term and in the long term. And um, and we also had for, for several months this year in 2022, the Land Conservation Department had an open uh, tech, conservation technician, technician position that also saved money. So the long story short is that we feel that there are multiple mechanisms in which between the two departments, we um, will be able to cover the cost of the increases to salaries and wages moving forward until 27. The Register of Deeds Department. Um, so I had a long conversation with our Register of Deeds and she had just come back from a, an association meeting, a Register of Deeds Association meeting where the Wisconsin Counties Association ha is lobbying for, um, so anytime a, a property tra transfers, there's a fee and 20% currently goes to the county and 80% of that fee goes to the state. There is a statewide movement um, to change that back to 50-50, which is what it was in previous years. And because of the large state, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The state has a, an excess. <laughs> um, WCA is very confident that they are going to get that to pass. And so this would produce an additional, and this is being very conservative, but it would produce an additional income of $59,000 per year or more in the Register of Deeds office. And so the last point we wanted to make is that land and zoning are moving into the same space within the courthouse. And because, through the uh, Richland County Strategic Plan, we have also been asked to evaluate and determine how we could combine departments in more than just space. And we also feel there's ways we could identify efficiencies moving forward as we combine those departments. So between all of those items, um, the committee feels comfortable in saying that we can meet the requirements of the resolution and we do not need anything put on the referendum. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Luck for the work You're to be commended once again. Uh, we no longer have a quorum, so I'm going to adjourn the meeting and our next scheduled meeting would be
we really haven't decided that, I guess. Um, I would say December 6th would be a time. But we may we have to, to for that. Mr. Chair, yeah. do we need to meet again to make, don't we need to send as many things forward as we can to the referendum committee before December, or, or do we have until the end of December to, to send all of this to them? I have to talk to Sean. They did not have a meeting Monday night, I don't believe. Correct. Are you guys talking? Because I can't hear anything right now. Adjourned, Melissa, but we're talking about our next meeting. Okay. Yeah, we really need to do something about making sure everybody can show up. This is getting a little crazy. Gary was there, but he has another meeting at 7. If he doesn't make that, they don't have a quorum. So.